Good evening, everyone, and welcome to The Edge and to the Deacon Oration. I wish to begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, the traditional owners of the land on which we are gathered today. We pay our respects to their elders and ancestors for allowing us to have our gathering on their land, acknowledge their continuing connection to this beautiful country, and thank them for their care and custodianship over many thousands of years. I extend this respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. Education has a long and rich heritage on this continent, which we aim to honour and reflect in the ways we teach and learn. And now we would like to show you an Acknowledgement of Country video produced by the team at Deakin University. Deakin University would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of all the unceded lands, skies and waterways on which our students and staff come together. As we learn, teach, innovate and research through virtually and physically constructed places across time, we pay our deep respect to the elders and ancestors who have cared for the country that you join us from an ancient place where education, innovation and knowledge transfer have taken place for many thousands of years. At Deakin, we aim to nurture and continue this important legacy whilst encouraging our communities to walk softly on country in the spirit of sustainability. In particular, we give gratitude to the elders and ancestors of Wadawurrung country, Wurundjeri country, and Eastern Ma Country and beyond, where our physical campuses are located. Their contributions to our learning communities and environments are rich and highly valued. Deakin is committed to embedding Indigenous knowledges and perspectives in all disciplines that we teach, as well as advancing the self-determined interests of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, including treaty and truth-telling. As you move around our physical and virtual environments, take a moment to consider, appreciate and listen deeply to the country beneath your feet. And we're privileged not only about the country um, in which we live, but also about the city in which we live. Um, good evening and welcome. And tonight, a very special welcome to our 2023 Brooks Oration Speaker, the Right Honourable, the Lord Mayor of Melbourne, Sally Cap AO. I also would like to welcome members of the Brooks family who are with us tonight, to members of the Deakin Council who are here, to members of the Deakin University Executive, um, donors, alumni, supporters, friends. That means I've captured everybody in the room. The annual Brooks Oration was established in 2006 by the Deakin Business School to encourage thoughtful debate on the contributions of corporate Australia to the global community. I wonder if, if in 2006 we would have realised how important directors' duties avoiding doing harm, not only financial harm but harm to the environment um, and many other things. Um, I don't think the word greenwashing, for example, would have been around in 2006. Um, tonight is to honour the, the significant contributions of Sir Wilfred Brooks, grandson of Alfred Deakin, who served as Prime Minister of Australia three times in the first decade of our nation. Sir Wilfred continued the family's association with the university as chairman of the Deakin University Foundation. In 1981, Sir Wilfred honoured us by giving an address to our very first MBA class. Each year, Deakin's two top MBA graduates are presented by the family with the Brooks Medal. Um, and as part of tonight, I would encourage you all to celebrate um, this presentation and by using our official hashtag, um, hashtag Brooks Oration. And I'd now like to welcome Professor Ian Martin, the Deakin University Vice-Chancellor, to the stage. Professor Martin. Thank you very much indeed, Jenny. Uh, it is a great pleasure as Vice-Chancellor to be here tonight. 
Um, in opening, I want to acknowledge that our wonderful city is on the unceded lands of the Boomerang and Wurundjeri people and celebrate their incredible contributions over tens of millennia. Welcome to Deacon's Chancellor, Mr. John Stanhope, members of our University Council and Executive, and as Jenny said, everybody else in the room, friends and supporters of Deakin University. But I'd particularly like to reiterate my gratitude to the Brooks family for their ongoing support of Deakin University, but also personally their support and engagement with me. Tonight, I also want to acknowledge the late Mr. Roger Brooks, who made hugely significant contribution to Australian society in business and philanthropy. And this event certainly reflects Roger's lifelong passion for the ongoing of betterment of society and its institutions. Roger is absolutely with us in spirit tonight. As Jenny said, the Brooks Oration is a much anticipated event in the university calendar. And tonight, we're absolutely privileged to hear from Melbourne's Lord Mayor, Sally Cap AO. Sally has an impressive career to date. In October 2020, she was re-elected Lord Mayor of Melbourne, having previously been elected in May 2018, and in doing so, became the first woman to be directly elected as Lord Mayor. There is nobody in this room who would not see Sally as a passionate advocate for this fantastic city. Her priorities include setting the pace and driving a prosperous city economy, helping rough sleepers get more support in the pathway into secure housing, and ensuring Melbourne remains a global leader in environmental sustainability. She's absolutely committed to seeing Melbourne reclaim the title of the world's most livable city. She's currently chair of the Council of Capital Cities, Lord Mayors, and also a member of the federal government's Urban Policy Forum. In 2023, she was appointed an officer of the Order of Australia in the King's Birthday Honours for distinguished service to the people of Melbourne, to local government, to business, and to the community through various organisations. And anyone who sees Sally's prodigious workload know the contributions she has made to all of those. In 2019, she was named the McKinnon Emerging Political Leader of the Year and was the first woman to hold the post of Agent General for Victoria in the UK, Europe and Israel. She served as the CEO for the Committee for Melbourne and Victorian Executive Director of the Property Council of Australia. Well, up till now, everything's fantastic. Unfortunately, she's also a passionate Collingwood Football Club supporter, and she made history in 2004 by being the club's first female board member. <laughs> and she tells me she's pretty nervous for this week. Um, Sally began her career as a solicitor after completing law, ONS and commerce degrees at the University of Melbourne. She's held senior, senior roles at both KPMG and ANZ and co-founded a small business which she took to the ASX. She's involved in a number of charities and sits on the board of the Olivia Newton-John Cancer Research Institute, the Mary Jane Lewis Scholarship Foundation and the Melbourne University Faculty of Business and Economics. I could go on. Sally's contributions are prodigious. I do not know where she fits it all in. But on the topic, do cities matters anymore? Please, can I welcome to the stage to deliver the 2023 Brooks Oration, the Right Honourable, the Lord Mayor of Melbourne, Sally Capayo. Well, thank you, Ian. What a warm, warm welcome. Much appreciated. Uh, and it really is an honour to be with you all this evening, giving this year's Brooks Oration. We are here at the edge. We're on the lands of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people. And on behalf of everybody who lives and works and plays and visits the city of Melbourne, I pay respects to elders past and present. And I'm voting yes. I also acknowledge this evening uh, the many esteemed guest, uh, guests and dignitaries here with us. John Stanhope AM, who is the Chancellor, uh, and Sue Stanhope, Professor Ian Martin, our Vice-Chancellor of Deakin, and Fiona Martin, Professor Jenny light Allers, Acting Executive Dean Business and Law. I'm looking forward to hearing about the uh, winning scholars later. 
members of the Brooks family uh, and the Brooks uh, Scholar recipients, uh, and of course to all of you. I'm absolutely delighted to see you here in the city on a Monday night. Thank you. Now, uh, I just want to quickly, um, and I've got a lot of my team here and I'm sidebarring already, but to all of the Brooks family, please hang on to your seats for a moment because I've just discovered with Rubina that I am related to you by marriage. Um, I hope that comes as a delight to you. Uh, it certainly comes as a surprise to me and I can't wait to share those stories over a glass of wine later. But it's an extra honour then to be here giving this oration this evening. And tonight I am exploring, of course, I, I've got here one of my favourites, probably my favourite topic, cities. And in particular, whether they matter any more. It's a question that has been creeping into the psyches and headlines around the world, weighing heavily on city leaders in the wake of the pandemic. We've experienced the biggest disruption in our lifetimes, a global pandemic that shut down the world. And that disruption has impacted cities in many ways to the point where people are questioning their importance in a contemporary context. Do cities still matter in 2023? Well, as you can imagine, I believe they do, of course. They always have and always will matter, provided they transform with the needs and wants of our population. Cities matter when and only when they prioritise people. Here in Melbourne, we've learned the hard way that cities are nothing without people. So how do city leaders deliberately build cities as magnets for people? Cities that leapfrog these deep shocks that are experienced from time to time to unlock opportunities and to ensure that they matter more than they ever did before. The history of cities provides us with a good roadmap. Did cities matter prior to the pandemic? Well, think about yourself pre-COVID and how you interacted with the city. Did the city matter to you? It's hard to see you all. I hope you're all nodding your heads because I say at a quick glance around this room, I hope I can assume that the answer is a resounding, hell yeah, this city mattered. It's been a global phenomenon over centuries that people have coalesced around metropolises. These are the places that generated the innovation and activity that has driven human development. Now that's evident on the banks of the river just behind us this evening where a semicircle of metal shields represents the five groups of the Kulin Nation, signifying that Melbourne, Nam, has been an important gathering place for Aboriginal people to discuss matters of importance for tens of thousands of years. And it's evident across the world too Ancient Roman cities were places to discuss and to debate, debate, to trade, to be educated, be entertained, admire arts and cultures and eat. All aspects that still make for a truly great city today. Whether it be a natural disaster, war, plague, fire or disease, historically cities have had to evolve and change with severe shocks. Indeed, I think there's a responsibility to do so, to ensure that a crisis does not completely defeat a community, but rather that it can gather strength and knowledge to become better. The New York subway, the busiest in the Western world, was built after the great blizzard of 1888 that halted all rail and road transport. The Great Fire of London in 1666 led to an overhaul of town planning to address poor living conditions. And whilst we don't welcome a crisis, history shows us that these types of shocks have necessitated an adjustment, often an innovation for the better. 
This imperative to adapt, to become better, is what consumes city leaders now as we advocate for better post-pandemic cities. What we've experienced over the past three years may be unprecedented in modern history, but cities have experienced shocks before and kept growing and kept holding ground as the centres of civilizations. Now, I remember being at the Committee for Melbourne in 2007 when it was proclaimed that there were officially more people living in cities across the world than in rural and regional environments. It was the first time, the tipping point of more people in cities. And that figure has continued to trend upward with more than 4.3 billion people living in urban areas in 2019. But why? What is it that draws people to cities and are those factors still relevant today? Now, I believe that cities that continue to evolve uh, and refuse to be one dimensional are the cities that survive and remain as magnets for people. Cities historically, I believe, were multifaceted. They have had that magnetism. They have been places where people can work, learn, create, live and play as individuals and in groups. They were places that attracted great wealth, but also offered opportunities for those who came with nothing. They were places to discover, connect and collide, to collaborate and create, to experience and share, to care and heal places for innovation and socialisation, for forming community identity and providing a platform for individuals to flourish. Cities were all of this and were fundamental in the development of human civilization. It made me ask what would not have been invented if we didn't have cities? Writing and papermaking developed in the city of Nanjing. Steam trains that developed and prospered in Liverpool and Manchester. And in Melbourne, this great civilization, we've invented Wi Fi, the first feature film, the eight hour workday, and the first frozen embryo. Amazing. I could add Vegemite and Aussie rules, but I'm not sure the world would thank us for those inventions at this point. But seriously, Melbourne has been a powerhouse city and was flying pre-pandemic. In the decade prior to COVID, Melbourne had been named the world's most livable city for seven consecutive years. We were the engine room of the state's economy, the fastest growing city in Australia and the fourth fastest growing in the OECD. Our streets and footpaths were bustling with a million people each day. City workers, students and visitors, both local and international. We were world renowned as Australia's best student city and its events and arts and sporting capital. People admired our street art and our art galleries, our libraries and our writers underpinning our status as a UNESCO city of literature, our universities and our respect for learning. So I think it's pretty clear that cities mattered pre-pandemic, but has that changed now? Has the pandemic changed the trajectory of the importance of cities? Well, today, some 56% of the world's populations continue to live in cities. In Australia, we've always been above the world benchmark and we have almost 87% of our population living in cities and 77% of Victorians live in Greater Melbourne. Just as was the case pre-pandemic, this trend is expected to continue with the urban population more than doubling its current size, its forecast, by 2050. This means that seven out of 10 people will live in cities in the next 27 years. Wow. 
And cities still account for the largest percentage of our economic output as a society. More than 80% of global gross domestic product is generated in cities. The city of Melbourne still accounts for 20% of Victoria's gross state product. Cities are the epicentres of infrastructure still. All roads, trains and waterways lead to cities. Cities still have the best hospitals and schools, universities and cultural institutions. So with all of those resources for people still existing in cities, is it any wonder that they continue to be at the centre of population growth? Last year, the UN released its World Cities Report, which confirmed that cities are here to stay and the future of, of, this future of humanity is undoubtedly urban. The great exodus from cities that was reported during and immediately post the pandemic was temporary. People remain attracted to the dynamism of cities, the people you meet, the kind of experiences that are only possible when people come together at scale. Here in Melbourne, we are seeing city activation boom. Record attendances at events like the Grand Final, the Grand Prix and the Ed Sheeran concert, which, by the way, broke the national record for attendance at a ticketed concert when he performed this March, and it's still Ed's biggest audience ever. Our weekends and weeknights are booming as people from near and far uh, flock to soak up our world-class dining, retail and entertainment scene. And as of this year, we have been ranked Australia's best student city for nine consecutive years, even during the pandemic, with almost 100% of our pre-pandemic international student cohort back in the city. All of these are great markers about the relevance of Melbourne. City confidence through investment remains strong here in the third most livable city in the world. Last month, I attended the opening of the uh, new head office for the uh, biotech giant CSL, $2 billion headquarters there on Elizabeth Street. It's a remarkable 18-storey building that will house 800 staff in its laboratories, along with 40 biotech startups providing new career opportunities and research possibilities right here in Melbourne. We'll also soon welcome an ambitious new mixed-use development in Southbank, just as an example, that will become the tallest skyscraper in the Southern Hemisphere, incorporating new workspaces and residents, as well as attracting a new cultural partnership with Centre Pompidou. You know I'm head of sales because I'm going to keep going. There's also confidence in the future of our tourism industry. We've seen six new hotels open in this year alone, including the Ritz-Carlton, which is currently Australia's tallest hotel. The economy, like our skyscrapers, is soaring. Melbourne's early stage startup ecosystem also growing, 43% in the past year alone to $37 billion. And the entire Victorian uh, startup ecosystem, which I acknowledge Deakin has so much to do with driving, not just here in Melbourne City, uh, but in Burwood and particularly in Geelong, is now valued at more than $90 billion. Congratulations, everyone. Now, this means that our gross local product here in the city of Melbourne alone is exceeding pre-COVID levels, something that if you'd told me during COVID would have knocked me over with a feather. Pre-COVID, we hit a new record high in our gross local product of $104 billion. And despite the disruptions of the pandemic, where we saw massive drops in our gross local product, last June, the June just gone, we hit $114 billion in gross local product. That represents the economic activity of everybody in this room. 
Now, similar growth trajectories have us on track to meet our forecast for this year, $120 billion by the end of this financial year, and to achieve our aspiration in our economic development strategy of a $150 billion economy by 2031. Simply extraordinary. And we are seeing similar economic activity in major cities around the world. I'm lucky to check in with mayors of other major cities regularly, and I can tell you that my fellow mayors in cities such as LA, Paris and London have said that they've had a very busy summer of tourism, a lot of Aussies, I think, uh, but that this economic activity means that they are returning their focus post-stimulus uh, into long-term initiatives such as responding to climate change and affordable housing. So great economic uplift in cities around the world. So with all of this, with that great list I've just given you of what's been happening here in Melbourne and cities around the world, why does this question persist of whether cities matter anymore? I think it's because in this post-pandemic world, a city's worth has been reduced simply to the number of workers back at desks. And I'm saying that this fails to capture the many reasons why cities have always existed and always mattered. Now, this could be contentious, but who's seen the Barbie movie? Couple of hands up, brave people in this uh, auspicious audience. Uh, well, I have, and I can't help but think of the character Ken. His job is beach, and he does beach well but it's so limiting, and he spends the moving railing against this stereotype. He wants to be more than just Ken, and cities want to be more than just central business districts, because cities aren't just for work. Those cities that have flourished over the centuries never were just about work. And we've seen the demise of cities, uh, one well-reported one such as Detroit, that were only about work. But I'm glad to say that Detroit has reinvented itself to the point where it's hosting a World Economic Forum conference this year, focusing on transformation of cities. So a good city is not just one thing. It's not just a central business district. But I do acknowledge that cities as drivers of economic possibilities remains important, and I think that is still central to the future of cities. So let me take you through a couple of things. I think that's why the obsession about cities mattering is understandable. This focus on a central business district without focusing on the diversity. And the biggest impact we've had since COVID has been on the ways that we choose to work into the future. We were stuck in a nine to five, Monday to Friday habit, weren't we? The pandemic changed the need to be present in the workplace, changed the working rhythm of cities everywhere. Technology wasn't entirely new, but lockdowns forced its full adoption across our workforces. And now people are exercising the choice that technology made real. Employees can now choose a more flexible approach to where and when they work. Monday to Friday, nine to five is so yesterday. But what is the working cadence of today? We are no longer the city of corporate conformists that John Brack depicted in his seminal painting, Collins Street, 5 p.m., which hangs in our beautiful National Gallery of Victoria. And so it's no wonder that commentators and critics are now questioning what remote work means for cities as central business districts. The two parts to my answer to this this evening uh, are what we have seen emerge so far. In the first in instance, I am calling it tonight, a workforce that works from home full time was a lockdown phenomenon that has not survived in a post-lockdown environment. 
but we are experiencing an evolution in flexible working. Just like past shocks, I predict that cities will adapt and thrive to this new way of working. Pleasingly, Melbourne led the charge to adjust to an eight hour work day. That was a big change. And we are now adjusting to a flexible working environment because this allows people to have greater autonomy, to prioritise doing what matters to them when and where it suits their lifestyle. And as city leaders, we can't control what happens inside workplaces, but I know that business leaders are attending to those matters with some urgency now. And their conversations are more nuanced than ever before. Type of work, demographics of employees, needs of clients and customers, relationships with stakeholders and suppliers, ability to learn on the job and differentiated workplace culture, to name a few. As an employer, the City of Melbourne, we're having exactly the same types of conversations with our team. But there is also, we feel, a new appreciation for the value of in-person, in-workplace time. Collaborate, create, invent, learn, practice, socialisation, and that list goes on too. While each individual workplace needs to establish its own rhythm, city leaders must facilitate the other things that matter to people so that cities offer a unique and compelling place to work and a place to come for the best healthcare, the best education, the best experiences outside the workplace to complement what happens inside the workplace. There is a symbiosis that exists in cities, but the balance has shifted, there's no doubt. More than ever, cities need to be relevant to different people at different times for different reasons. And this is the best approach, we think, to a vibrant city. It's not about just one thing, it's about everything. A place where people want to be, not a place where people are forced to be. And this includes being a great place to work because we need cities to remain the epicentre of economic activity that have halo effects for regional and rural areas. Renowned American urbanist Richard Florida famously writes about the clustering of people and productivity, creative skills and talents that power economic growth. And Nobel Prize winning economist Robert Lucas identified the concentration of people and ideas in cities as the most fundamental force but behind innovation and economic growth. There's no reason to think that the same tendency to cluster will be all that different in a post-pandemic world. We just need to embrace a hybrid working pattern that lifts all boats balanced, happy people who have the benefit of flexibility while embracing the collaboration, the innovation and the productivity that comes from in-person, in-workplace connection. Global management consultant McKinsey says that hybrid work has settled to an average of 3.5 days in the workplace across key cities like Beijing, London, New York and Paris. So it's not work from home and it's not work in the office. The new reality is work in both. Instead of being daunted by this shift, we must embrace the opportunities generated by this change if we are to remain successful cities. In terms of the most immediate area that requires adaptation, most of the focus falls on the extra spaces that flexible working creates in city buildings? It's my most often asked question at the moment. And when I see vacant office space and empty shop fronts, I still get a shiver of concern. But these spaces also represent an opportunity if we, as a society, are more deliberate in how those spaces get filled. At the City of Melbourne, we will continue to champion a city with full occupancy of office and retail spaces, bursting with activity. I'm a seven day a week kind of gal. But we should be encouraged about the startups, the creatives and the emerging sectors that can now come into city spaces when pre-pandemic it was full. 
For instance, with its world-class innovation, research and development sector, Melbourne has a competitive edge to establish a flourishing zero carbon jobs cluster. Economists suggest that the transition to net zero will deliver up to $680 billion to the Australian economy if we grab this opportunity, and that could create an additional 250,000 jobs. And I want to see the lion's share of those in Melbourne. Spaces can also be repurposed and adapted to solve issues of housing, uh, both access and affordability, carbon emissions and city activation. And we know that creating diversity in both our city and our economy will ensure that our city matters to many people. Business owners and workers, residents and visitors and students too. We've never been and we never will be, will be a one trick pony city. Deliberately, preserving and elevating the diversity that we've had on offer and that we will continue to have on offer ensures that we will welcome more people generating energy and perspectives, and that's what I call a modern city, a city that matters. So where does that leave us? I think that world-leading cities need to drown out the noise and the opinions of those trying to force us to matter in just one sense. Like the great modern oracle Kylie Minogue says, we're spinning around, we're not the same, so move out of our way. Instead of questioning whether cities matter, we must focus on people, on their needs and their aspirations and their expectations, and use the disruption of the pandemic to accelerate our pace for delivering for people. And we do so much consultation from people all across Victoria to ask what do they want when we're building our council plan and our strate strategic plans. And they tell us they want affordable housing and they want fulfilling work and they want green open spaces and essential services. They want world-class education and events care and connection, clean and safe spaces, and they want responses to climate change. It's a long list, but we can do it. Melbourne has an impressive track record of transformation to remain relevant. Take postcode 3000, for example. In the mid 80s, critics called Melbourne a moribund city in a rust bucket state. Following the financial crisis in the 80s, workers were leaving city workplaces and many were leaving the state. I was a young worker at the time and I remember thinking, am I going to have a future in this city? But Postcode 3000 was a groundbreaking approach taken by the City of Melbourne, bringing a wave of residents to the city and activating more arts, more sport, more dining, retail and education offers. The City of Melbourne in the mid 80s was home to 685 people. Uh, and that, so that's 40 years ago. 20 years ago, we had 24,000 residential apartments. And today, we have 98,000 apartments available for people to live. 20 years ago, our tallest building was a 52-floor office tower. Now, our tallest building is a residential building of 100 floors. 20 years ago, you could choose almost uh, from almost 1,000 cafes and restaurants. And if you walk out of here right now, you will have a dizzying choice of over 2,000 restaurants and cafes, 800 of which serve coffee. Our love for coffee is as eternal as the pool of cities, we've decided. Now this transformation, this postcode 3000 brought us global acclaim. And perhaps I reflect in the cities, sorry, in the 80s, perhaps we'd become too one dimensional. We've shown since then that cities aren't and never should be one dimensional. They must be multi-dimensional to offer what matters to a diversity of people. We hold on to that legacy now as we wholeheartedly embrace the post-pandemic 
evolution and drive the vision of tomorrow. Just as we've experienced a once-in-a-lifetime pandemic, we have a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to reimagine next Melbourne. We've got big, bold ambitions to ensure that our city remains relevant into the future. We are being deliberate about our investments and our initiatives to create Melbourne next. For example, I can't wait in the next few years to stroll along the rejuvenated north bank of the Yarra River Birrarung on a boardwalk that connects a network of green open spaces, Aboriginal storytelling, native plantings, event spaces, and new outdoor dining establishments that will stretch all the way along from Birrarung Ma to the Balti Bridge. I can't wait to look up at our skyline and see even more logos of homegrown international business success stories like CSL light up our night skyline. And to find fewer people sleeping rough and more people achieving their full potential thanks to projects like Make Room and a strong pipeline of affordable housing. We're already a city that doesn't stand still and the new metro tunnel stations open in 2025, simplifying the commute and allowing more people to flow into our universities, our research labs, our exciting new office spaces, galleries, retail and world-class events. Maybe there are no hoverboards in the next five years, uh, but there will still be e-scooters riding safely amongst other forms of transport in a comprehensive modern transport system. And of course, the Melbourne Arts Precinct with the new Fox NGV Contemporary Gallery, along with new public art projects that haven't even been announced yet that will reinforce our status as a global arts and culture destination a city that is cleaner and greener, fairer and more inclusive than ever before, a place where people feel they belong, where they want to belong. These are the outcomes driving our deliberate decisions today. It's as simple and as complex as that, really. When you deliberately create a good city for people, you create a city that matters. Maintaining relevance is a challenge and shocks like the pandemic prompt important questions. But history shows us that cities that survive don't offer just one thing or another. They offer a variety and a scale in proportions that can't be sustained in surrounding regional and rural areas but they do have a halo effect that send ripples of opportunity further afield. Cities aren't static, they have the best ability to adapt and flex, leap and stride into change and transformation. Provided people remain at the centre of what is being delivered and why, this must be absolutely central to what we all do as leaders in our city. A city does not matter without people. The pandemic brought us this sharp fact uh, and in the most extraordinary extreme ways. And maybe that's what this question demands of us, to remember that cities will always matter if leaders make decisions that are in the best interests of people and humanity. We're not looking back, we're looking better because Melbourne matters. Thank you. Lord Mayor, I can't quite work out how Ken got a Guernsey um, in, this, uh, in, the, in the narrative, but I'm sure that if he could step out of the movie after hearing you talk about Melbourne, he'd be here. Um, it, a fabulous, um, inspirational discussion on why cities matter, in particular why Melbourne matters. Um, but for all cities, as you've um, spoken about tonight, they're places of transformation if you prioritise people. They're places of innovation if you prioritise people um, and coffee. So, Lord Mayor, thank you. Thank you for an amazing speech. Thank you very much.
I'd like to now invite the Lord Mayor Sally Cap and Professor Martin back on stage for a final thank you. And just before I let you go out to explore the city um, and to check out some of those bars, coffee shops, restaurants and other things that are within walking distance of where we are, um, tonight is about what um, a donation, a foundation, um, a legacy can actually do to support our students. And you've seen it tonight with um, our award winners, Sherry and Lauren. Um, and donations make a difference to lives. So if you would like to understand more about leaving a legacy um, to Deacon like Roger, apparently if you take out your mobile phones, um, we're not spying on you, but you'll be able to view a QR code on the screen um, and there is an opportunity for you to actually investigate more what opportunities there might be for you to create a legacy within Deacon too. Um, but in the meantime, thank you. Um, thank you, for, um, Lord Mayor, a, a lovely oration. But then we do have people here from Geelong, so I'd like to make them feel a little bit included as well. Um, but cities clearly matter. Thank you very much. Thank you.